I am not he, but I'm going to read Matthew 13, 3 through 9. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and he sowed some, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Thank you, Mr. Jim, and thank you, Mr. Wayne, for the introduction this morning. Today, we will be in Matthew 13, verse 18, the parable of the sower explained. What do you call a sleepwalking nun? Ariel, you can't, you can't tell them the answer to this one. A Roman Catholic. Okay, let me ask you a serious question now. Is the gospel enough to change a life? According to Jesus, it depends. It depends on the particular life and how the gospel is received. Now, let me ask a personal question. Do you really want to change? The typical answer that we get is usually yes, that you want Jesus to help you grow and change in your life, being more like Christ every day. If so, then today, maybe you just need some encouragement, a new insight or new information or some new insight. But this parable makes me second guess who is truly asking that question. Do you really want the word of God to change you and your life, to keep on changing you? Or do you want to continue sinning, claiming to be of God? In verse 19, it states, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. The path is hard to pack soil, a hardened heart, and the evil one is Satan, and the seed is God's word in your life. You've got people that give you God's word day to day, or you read it on your own, but you turn away from God, and you let Satan snatch it out of your life. You've got a hardened heart from sin, and you don't want to turn away, and you deny God knowing you need him. Maybe something tragic in your life has happened and you're holding that against God. Maybe you got a, a divorce and it ended very badly. Or maybe you or parents or someone that you know has had cancer before and they died a horrible, tragic death. Maybe your parents were abusive or are still abusive verbally, physically, however that may be. Maybe you were sexually assaulted or lost a son or a daughter. All of those things happen in life and everyone's gotta to come to grips with him. But God can help you overcome those things and come to him. Now, Ezekiel eleven nineteen 19 through 20 is a good example of this. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit. I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. So you have a heart of stone from sinning continually over years, months, maybe even decades. But God takes that heart of stone and you accept him into your life and he gives you a new renewed heart of flesh so that you can do his work and do his bidding and do his will, ultimately bringing other followers and friends and brothers and sisters in Christ to the kingdom of heaven. There's a movie, I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen it, is God's Not Dead. Amazing movie, I'll try not to spoil it too much for the people who hasn't seen it. But um, there's this young man in, I believe it's a philosophy class or a theological class. And the professor 
wants everyone to write out on a piece of paper that God's not dead. And I believe it's they pass the final or something like that. They get a very significant portion of their grade um, already ahead of time. Well, because of this, the Christian student doesn't want to do any of that. Now, all of the other students wrote it, the three words, God's not dead, easy enough, handed it in. Well, he had a super big problem with that. And he comes to grips with it, and the professor offers him an opportunity to debate him. I believe it's once a week on a Friday during one of their classes. And if he loses, he fails the class. But through this whole course of him doing these uh, debates with his professor, you come to find out that the professor's mother died with cancer in a very tragic way. And ultimately, he blames God for that because you have this all-loving God that is supposed to be loving and caring, and he lets someone die this way. But he comes to grips with the Lord and knows that the Lord is not the one who tempts people or puts these things in their path. He's ultimately the one that helps them overcome these, these temptations and trials and tribulations. And if you really find yourself relating to the path, being hardened from sin, and you deny God and you turn away from him, you can know that you can be forgiven and he will give you a heart of flesh from that heart of sin. And he's waiting for you to open your heart to him so that he can come in and change you. But we often realize that sometimes change isn't wanted. What about the seed that falls on the rocky ground? In verse, Matthew 13, verse 20, it states, as for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on the count of the word, immediately he falls away. You had joy in the Lord when you first know him. You know that you need him also. And ultimately you are happy because you found salvation. But when tribulation and trials arise, you flee. I've often, when the word flee arises in this passage, I think of a dog running from like a big bear or something with its uh, tail tucked up underneath its legs, just running for its life is what I often think about. And oftentimes you let others tell you what is right or wrong about the Bible. You let a minister or a preacher stand up and tell you you're saved or this needs to happen for you to come to the God kingdom of God. And there's a gentleman that I knew that was exactly like the rocky ground. His name is Sebastian. He was a good friend of mine. I was in the Navy for three years before dedicating my life to the Lord. And during that time, I started reading the Bible and starting to know God and start to become part of the kingdom of God. And he really started to take an interest in that. Notice that my feelings towards certain things have changed, my actions, and uh, I ultimately stopped, tried to stop cussing for a while. I'm sure you guys have heard the term curse like a sailor. It was definitely something that was hard to get rid of, but it was part of the things that I wanted to get rid of. And I remember us starting to do Bible studies together and started reading the Bible every day for, for weeks on end. And ultimately, it, it was when people started to persecute and start making fun of him that ultimately he gave it up. I remember one day he, I asked him like, hey, do you, are, we, are we reading the Bible today? Like, no, no, I'm okay. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with it. I don't, I don't want anything to do with that anymore. And I started noticing that it really started weighing heavy on him that people were bothering him about this. And he actually got sprinkled baptized in, um, on, on the ship during an underway, which I don't believe in by the way. But um, it, was, it was kind of to show that little bit of dedication to God. And people really, it, it really started to itch with him that people started bugging him. And he ultimately, he gave the whole life up. He started drinking, smoking weed. He got in really big trouble for, for doing some stuff that he shouldn't have been doing um, on, on the job. And ultimately, he, he went away from the Lord. Last time that I heard of him, he was still in those worldly things. But when the persecutions and tribulations arised, he ultimately fled. Galatians 1, 6 through 7. I'm astonished 
that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and returning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but, but there are some who trouble you and you want to, and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from the heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. Now, in this context, verse eight doesn't, doesn't matter too, too much um, because they're not preaching another gospel. But the fact is that they deserted God, Jesus Christ, who called them so quickly, even though that you know you need the grace of God. You need that salvation through God, ultimately, to, to get you into the kingdom of heaven. Well, we know that rocky ground doesn't have any roots underneath it. But how can we get rooted in God if we, if we really want to persevere in those tribulations and persecutions? Well, we need to increase your relationship with him. You need prayer, worship. And if really, if your life reflects the rocky ground, you can turn to Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints that is breadth and the length and the height and depth and know that the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. For those of you that don't understand what verse 19 is saying here, you can understand that, that ultimately the love of Christ that he gives you, knowing that we are sinful people, knowing we're gonna continually sin and desire that sin, he still loves us and ultimately gave his life for us. And all you have to do is ask him into your heart if you really are still in those worldly desires and he will come into you and change you from the inside out. It's not very fast, it's a slow process and you continually have to renew your mind with the word of God and stay within God, God's hand, because he won't let you leave once, once you're in there. And I think that's such a blessing, just knowing that you know Christ, so once you've passed those persecutions and tribulations and tests, that ultimately you're, you, you're never gonna be able to go back because there's gonna be things that you try to turn to and you're, just, you're not gonna desire them anymore. So we know what happens when we're rooted in God. What about the things that we can't control in around us that can't control the things that are in and around us like the thorns in verse 22? As Matthew 13, 22, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfaithful. unfaithful. For me, I think most quote unquote Christians are here. When I, when I use air quotes, I... I'm starting not to like the word Christian, not because of what it stands for, but because of those who use it and don't know the true meaning behind it. So for me, I start using the word disciple and follower of Jesus Christ, just because I want to be the one following him and want to be the one that is stepping in the steps behind him in the sand, doing everything that he has ever done. Cares. The word cares here also means anxiety. The word in Greek is merimina, which means anxiety, worry, or care. So it also means the anxieties of the world. The anxiety of not knowing when you get fired from that job last week, where you're gonna go next, or if you've got a family, you don't know where the next paycheck's gonna come from, or where the next meal's gonna come from if you can't afford it. And ultimately, you also know your need for God and you deny it with some excuse to follow worldly desires. Maybe you keep just pushing it off until tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll read my Bible tomorrow. Tomorrow's always gonna be there, but tomorrow might not always be there because we know eventually one day God's gonna come back or Jesus Christ is gonna come back and ultimately be here for us. And we're gonna go up with him. Or maybe it's not for you. Maybe there's something in the Bible. Maybe it's baptism that you don't necessarily like oh, I don't, I don't think I need to be baptized to be saved. That's not what the Bible says. Maybe it's money. You desire the money of the world or your career more 
once I just get to this point, I'll have more time in my day to worship God and I'll start then. Maybe you just find comfort in life. You're just like sitting at home in your recliner or on the couch. For us, it's kind of a beanbag chair. Watching TV all hours of the afternoon, knowing that you can be more fruitful by being in God's word. One thing that we learned over this past week, uh, being at a, a sort of men's retreat over Monday through Friday, we were hiking in the, uh, in the wilderness, is don't put anything worthless in front of your eyes. That there are so many things of the world that we watch and entertain ourselves is exactly that. It's entertainment. You're supplying something where God should be. Not that it's inherently bad, or that the television show that you're watching it has some biblical principles that are not in the Bible, but just because it's almost worthless. If it's not for God, it sh shouldn't be in front of your eyes, in my opinion. And I know that's one thing that I've been struggling with and one thing I'm gonna keep on struggling with more than likely. Maybe it's your legacy. I need to do these certain things and reach this peak so that my family will remember me for the rest of my life but ultimately you're gonna be the one in front of God standing there, not your wife or your children. Especially nowadays with families coming together and getting married just because you have children. I feel like for us, there's so many people in our lives that are having children nowadays, friends, family, everybody from high school. And a lot of the times people idolize their families working 60, 80 hours a week instead of spending that time with God and showing their children who the Lord is. You think you know everything about everything that is to know in the Bible. And ultimately, if you don't come to God, you're gonna let the outside world dictate how your afterlife goes and how your life goes now. You're gonna let the news tell you one thing you need to hear and the other news is gonna, the other broadcaster is gonna tell you something, you need, something else you need to hear. And you're ultimately gonna to try to find somewhere in the middle that sounds right to you, but you're not gonna pick up the Bible to see what it has an opinion on that situation or things that it's telling you you shouldn't do. And I think a, a very good illustration for this is one of the disciples that we all know, his name is Judas. He gave Jesus's life up for 30 silver coins. A lot of people speculate that's between like $29 and like 340. Not really for sure how much it's worth, but he gave Jesus his life up for 30 silver coins. And ultimately he killed himself later on because of that, realizing he had sinned against the Messiah. He had sinned against the one who came to save them I think another good analogy for this is John 3, 16. For God gave his one and only son to come and die on the cross for us. But oftentimes they forget John 3, 36, which states, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. For these quote unquote Christians I see that, that John 3.16 everywhere. They've got it on tattoos. They've got it on their trucks. They've got it on their cars everywhere. But they don't realize that they've also got to be doers of the word. You can't just say, yeah, I believe in God, but not do the things he's called you to. Like in Mark 16.16, 16, repent and be baptized. You can't just say I'm a doer and not do. You can't walk the walk and not talk the talk. Or you can't, talk the talk and not walk the walk. Sorry about that. If you find yourself among the desires of the world, cling to God's word and study the scriptures daily. If you don't wanna be a part of the thorny ground, the things around you, pushing you where you need to go. Like we talked earlier in James, you don't need to be a doubter where you get pushed away or pushed by the wind of the sea. It says, if you have any questions or ask, and it will be given to you as in Matthew 7, 7. So recognizing three out of the four responses to God are negative. We need to pay special attention on how to become and stay 
good soil. In verse Matthew 13, verse 23, it states, as for what was grown on, or sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another 60 and another 30. So bearing fruit is understanding the word of God, the seed of God. And helping in the yield is maybe with a family member or a friend, seeing the seed be planted that God has put there or someone else in their life and watering that. Hey, do you need a, do you need a Bible study with me? Do, do you wanna read the Bible with me? Hey, come to church on Sunday with me. Maybe you'll hear a good preaching from, from someone here at the church. Knowing and doing what God commands us to do. Again, for instance, Mark 16, 16. Repent and be baptized. Just knowing that God is our creator isn't enough. You ultimately have to do what he also calls you to. Even the demons believe and they tremble at the, even the name of Jesus, but they believe, but they just don't do what God wants them to do. A man that runs the School of Discipleship, his name is Darren Williamson. I've gotten to know him really good this summer and he's got an amazing family. He's got eight children and he is producing fruit in them and all of us interns. I believe there's six of us five or six of us interns. He's got a group called um, Project Antioch, which is a gap year program where students that just graduate actually get to go a full school year of studying the Bible, going to classes Monday through Friday, and then on the weekends going to different churches to experience different things. And then they also do classes where they go and travel to go see different relics or things of Christian. And they also do a, a hike where they go and get out of the world for a week and study the Bible. So he's producing massive amounts of fruit and not only his family's life, but in lives around him also. I think one of the, the biggest impacts he has had on me in, I guess, family relationships is just the fact of every night at six o'clock with all of his eight children, it's like, if anything ever comes up, six o'clock is praise and worship time and prayer time with dad at home. And that fruit is gonna continually go on through all of his family and all of his grandchildren and his great grandchildren and so on and so forth. And the massive amounts of fruit that he produces, we can also produce in our own lives by just doing and desiring the God and doing his word. Matthew seven fifteen is also a great analogy of this. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So you need to know if you are claiming to be of God and be in the kingdom of God, you need to be producing fruits in your life. You can't just say that I'm a Christian, but not be producing works from the grace of God that he gives us. To become and remain on good soil, you need to be willing to accept God's word and have faith and be baptized in him, knowing he's gonna pull the sinful weeds out of your life today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. So the four types of soil all get the same treatment. And so do we. We all get to hear God's word and know what's true in our hearts. We get to make the decision of which type of soil are we going to be. The hard soil, reluctant to change. The rocky ground, shallow and not really believing. Thorny ground is distracted by the world and its riches. Or the good soil, accepting Christ in helping him reach the people who need him the most. The seed does not change, only the ground at which it falls. Just as God's word does not change, only the ones who hear it change its meaning. Thank you guys for allowing me to be here today. 
And if you want to accept God into your heart and become part of his kingdom, I will be here. Uh, and I know we've got some, I believe we've got some elders in the building also that will be more than happy to help. Thank you.